<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, you're live, and just a moment, I'm going to run credits. Okay. And go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to Cab Notes for, it's actually May 12, 2017. This morning we're talking about the intriguing um corkscrew railroad that was built by Trenner Park and we have a lot of really helpful information to try to um, <clears throat> bring some of that to light for us uh, first of all we have these wonderful people here at the table George Larigo Thank you. who is a real railroad buff and your name is Patrick Purcell Patrick Purcell who's been in the railroads for a long time and we're very happy to have Kara here to help us um, hear about some of the things that Joe Parks wrote about the Corkscrew Railroad that were given to me um, a little while ago from the museum. So first of all, we'll let Kara read what the sign says, which is posted at the, we can hold this up here and you can, maybe some of you recognize that sign which is sit out in the parking lot of a museum. And this is what it says. <laughs> when wealthy North Bennington resident Trenner Park purchased the Bennington Rutland Railroad, he found that the railroad barons of the Troy and Boston Railroad refused him access to their New York lines. Rather than fight this monopoly, Park built a rail line from Bennington to Lebanon Spring, New York, where he could transfer his trains to southbound rails while bypassing Troy. The dozens of right turns over 40 miles of hilly terrain gave this stretch of railroad the name Corkscrew. Passenger service was cancelled in 1931 and the line was officially abandoned in 1953. Remnants of the old rail bed can be seen where it crossed the highway at this point. And I'm sure many people here in Bennington have been on parts of that uh, railroad bed which stretched around behind the monument and down toward the railroad station. So George and I are going to try to show you now on the map where the uh, Corkscrew Railroad went. Well, we're up uh, here is uh, North Bennington right here. And the line from North Bennington to Bennington was built first. And when Trenner Park had to continue, he continued by going out on a very circuitous route almost to the village of Husik and then down across the main line of the Boston and Maine at a place called Petersburg Junction and then followed along on a, again a very circuitous route along the little Husik River and that went all the way down here as far as Chatham, which uh, this map doesn't uh, show. At Chatham, New York, they made their connections for the rail line to the south. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, George. And uh, maybe some of you remember some articles written by Joe Parks concerning the Corkscrew Railroad years ago. This was actually 2001. And uh, as you know, Joe Parks just passed away a couple weeks ago and Bennington's very indebted to him for all that he did for, for the town. <clears throat> so Kara's gonna read us the first article, which was written in the paper, what was June? 15th. <laughs> 15th in 01. <laughs> Last week we heard how, after years of frustrated waiting, Bennington finally got a railroad, the Bennington and Rutland, without building it. It reached North Bennington from Rutland in 1852, then turned west a few miles to State Line Station, where passengers detrained and traversed a long boardwalk built over the State Line to catch a train of a different line waiting to take them north to Cambridge, Salem, and Rutland, or west toward Troy, or the other way around. Two years later, in 1854, a spur line was built into Bennington, over which a shuttle train ran periodically to North Bennington and no farther, to allow passengers to connect to the main lines. 
If it sounds complicated and clumsy, it was, like everything else about Vermont railroading. Today, we will set the stage for the second railroad to reach Bennington. It would never have existed except for complications, clumsiness, and other defects, such as Vermont's community's insatiable desire to get railroads to foster development when there wasn't enough commerce to justify another railroad. Any difficulty foreseen by the wise men was denied by enthusiastic optimists and papered over to get the road built, after which the railroad management managements would find like cats and dogs for survival in an atmosphere of too little commerce and too many competitors. The second railroad to reach here, at first called the Lebanon Springs, later the Harlem Div Division, or the Corkscrew Line, really has no place in the Bennington picture until the late 1860s, so we must come back to it later. What was important in the 1850s were the first two railroads, the Vermont Central and Rutland Railroad, fighting each other for survival. The third line, the Bennington and Rutland, even less justifiable and more underfinanced than the bigger two, is the most important to Bennington because at least it came here. In 1863, a remarkable Vermonter came home from California, sailing from San Francisco to Panama, crossing the 40-mile isthmus to take another clipper that brought him to New York and by railroad up the Hudson to Troy and his new home, North Bennington. He was Trenner Park, born in Woodford, who as a young man had married a daughter of Highland Hall and read law in Bennington. When Hall went to San Francisco in a federal job, he invited young Park to come make his mark in the Wild West, which Park did, faster and more successfully than anyone could have imagined. He rose in the most prestigious law firm there and found time to have several careers all at once, making himself wealthy and successful. Besides his careers, he was a leader of the reform forces trying to make San Francisco honest, but there were assassins among the ruffian forces whose leaders he battled, hoping to kill him. There are rumors that when he left to board the ship for home, he was concealed in a coffin to be sure he got aboard alive. It's not necessarily true, but it's believable, because many men wanted him dead. Turner Park fancied railroads, since he was building one in California. Later he bought and ran the one across Panama, and made millions when he sold it to the De Lesseps Suez Canal Company, his share making him 70 million, 7 million, sorry. <laughs> The French tried unsuccessfully to build the Panama Canal before the U.S. did it in 1913. Within a short time of his arrival at father-in-law Highland Hall's farm in North Bennington, Park began construction of the immense Victorian mansion, now called the Park McCullough House. McCullough is the name of his daughter's husband, later Governor John G. McCullough. Always restless and looking for interesting action, especially against worthy opponents, Trenner Park became aware that the Bennington and Rutland line was poorly built and underfunded, its leaders and owners quarreling. The line's bond had a mortgage arrangement under trustees who had power to protect the bondholders in case of financial trouble. In a few years, the line was in trouble, so the mortgage trustees leased the line for 10 years to the Troy and Bennington Railroad, the same one which was digging the Hoosick Tunnel so slowly and needed the B&R route to get through to Boston from Troy via Rutland. Trenner Park saw an opportunity. If he could get voting control of the stock and bonds at a low price and make the company profitable, he might build up the value and make another fortune. There were disgruntled investors willing to send their holdings to sell their holdings at a loss, so he started quietly buying as cheaply as possible. In time, he had bought enough to gain voting control of both the stock and the bonds, so he stopped buying. By that time, the 10-year lease to the Troy and Boston was near its end, and he figured correctly they wanted the lease just long enough to complete the Hoosick Tunnel. A time, needed they, a time need they always underestimated. Park intended to take over operation of the BNR as soon as the 10-year lease expired on January 15, 1867. The next day, Park found that the Troy and Bennington had renewed the lease, presumably the lease gave them the right to renew without prior notice, and they had already assigned the lease to two individuals who were, more, who were then presidents of the two major railroads of Vermont, the Vermont Central and the Rutland Railroad. This turn of events must have fallen like a bomb on Trenner Park, as well as anyone else interested in the BNR. Since the Vermont Central and Rutland Railroad presidents, who incidentally were then or later governors of Vermont, had been strong and unfriendly competitors for years, it seemed remarkable that they were suddenly cooperating, raising a suspicion that the lease to them depended on an understanding that the Troy and Boston could use the line until the tunnel was complete, and that all three would cooperate in the future. Park's angry reaction was to file a lawsuit, or series of lawsuits, in the Vermont courts at Bennington against the Troy and Boston to terminate the lease and obtain uh, damage payments. The lease agreement had provided that the Troy and Boston would properly manage the equipment and trackage, but it had done nothing year after year, so Park claimed damaging the B&R by 50000 The Troy and Boston officials ignored him, and Park decided to give them a taste of his spunky nature.
Well, I guess not many people realize that uh, Park was involved in so much intrigue. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you, you start out to be a rail baron, you mm -hmm. take on all the trappings of being the rail baron, mm -hmm. and what's important to you is to get the job done. Yeah. Well, he certainly did that. <laughs> so, in the early part of the article, it says that there was not enough commerce to support those railroads that were there. So I wonder what kind of commerce people were anticipating when they built the railroads that never happened. Was that when the sheep went out, <laughs> the wool industry went south? <laughs> well, I, I think that uh, you have to put railroad in the context of its time when they were built, when they were first mm. built. Yeah. And in Vermont, the year 1849-50, that seems to be the year that most of Vermont towns who currently have rail service got their rail service in those particular years. And yeah. you had this rather large, uh, Vermont, you know, is a series of valleys connecting our mountains. Yeah, right. And uh, they both chose different routes, but uh, the two of them went at it. And it became personal, I guess, wouldn't you say, Patrick? I would say so, yeah. And uh, so that this, uh, they were kind of the rail barons within the city. But then you had Trenner Park, the new upshot from Woodford yeah. in Bennington, who had a lot of money and had great ambitions. And he found a way around their blockage. And, and the other thing to remember about this early period of time is that a lot of railroads failed. Uh, we have only about 60% of the railroads that were built in existence today. And they tend to be the earliest railroads that were built. And that is certainly the case with um, the Trenner Park line uh, over the hill to Chatham. Uh, and so you'll see later on in the show the comments that are made about how long the um, corkscrew railroad would last. Yeah. Well, probably the cor corkscrew was questionable from the very beginning. Uh, they never had very much online traffic. And when the people who built it went to Cornelius Vanderbilt to try to get funding, he was not in, at all encouraging and indicated that he felt that the railroad would have grass okay. growing on it within a hundred years. And as it came to pass, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as our program goes, it may have to be in two parts. <laughs> one part in May and one part in June. But we'll continue on with our park articles and if the interview we had last Tuesday uh, doesn't fit in this hour, we'll continue in June. <laughs> okay, what else does Mr. Park say? <laughs> um, whether the alleged damages to the line were a sham or real, we can't tell. On the day Smith and Page came to take over the BNR, they heard about the legal action that Trenner Park had taken. They weren't happy about being leases under an ugly lawsuit or being caught between two engineers, or two enemies, so they be decided on neutrality. Next, sheriff's deputies from Bennington County approached two uh, T&B locomotives in the yards at North Bennington, swung up to the cabs, served papers attaching the locomotives until the outcome of the court action, sent the employees down, and left the trains, sidetracked and padlocked, guarded by deputies. The chief deputy, a former sheriff, commandeered the B&R locomotive Highland Hall and set off to Rutland to seize another T&B locomotive reported to be there. T&B employees had telegraphed Rutland and Troy, however, so the locomotive Walloomsack sped west into New York State, escaping the jurisdiction of the sheriff. In the meantime, frantic activity in the TNB yards at Troy produced a counterattack party led by a worthy engineer named Wellington. This group gathered railroad workers armed with wooden clubs, put them in a short train, and set out for North Bennington at high speed until it passed the state line station. Then it coasted silently into the yards between the captured locomotives. On a whistle blast, the railroad workers swung up into the cabs, ejected the deputies, got up steam with pine knots, and broke the locks and opened switches. Then the three locomotives raced off to Troy together. Down in the yards at Pownall, 
Another party of deputies found a T&B locomotive to attach. In the darkness, all was quiet, so they went to a restaurant only to hear the sound of the locomotive chugging with low steam power toward New York with Engineer Wellington on the throttle. They ran after it, but it left them behind. The railroad war was over. Score four locomotives for the T&B, zero for Trenner Park and the Sheriff, except as a consolation prize, the T&B Engineer Wellington was caught in Vermont later and spent time behind bars. Hmm. The result? As far as this writer can tell, Trenner Park managed to kill the lease of the two railroad presidents, who may not have been so much in alliance with the T&B as he suspected, since they backed off. So far as we know, the court action was long delayed, and if ever decided at all, the result had become moot. Trenner Park, however, found himself in a bad spot. Although he got back the railroad to run as he wished, his adversary, the T&B, was in a position to keep enough business away from Park's railroad that he was forced to operate at a loss. Under the leadership of banker D. Thomas Vale of Troy as president, the T&B diverted all possible commerce away from Bennington and the BNR. How that was done, we'll explain. Park had been told by his lawyer, Phelps of Burlington, that the T&B had recently made a contract with another railroad, the Rensselaer and Saratoga, that went north through Cambridge, Salem, and Saratoga to Rutland, from where the T&B could send passengers and freight to Boston via the Rutland Road. Perhaps Park was more concerned with what he could do to his enemy than the reverse. Truth was, T&B no longer needed Park's BNR, but he needed them. Immediately after rescuing the four locomotives, they ignored Park's lawsuit, kept their personnel and equipment out of Bennington County, and simply refused to deliver or accept any passengers or freight at the state line crossing, coming no closer to it than Hoosick Junction, from where the Rensselaer and Saratoga line ran north. This doesn't mean the T&B could shut down the BNR completely, but only that they refused to meet and transfer between R&B and BNR trains at the state line station. To one in Park's situation, the lost revenues, if continued, would sooner or later be fatal to the B&R. Well, the plot thickens. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, the welling rate, I think, is probably, uh, it's, it's the Vermont equivalent of the great locomotive chase. <laughs> and uh, because oh. uh, our sheriff's posse got thirsty and had to eat, there weren't <laughs> enough of them to, to stave off the Irish of Troy, New York, who would come in with their axis and whatever they had to, to uh, take their engines back. Mm -hmm. And that whole business of uh, the uh, engine theft, I think, is one of Vermont's great stories <laughs> and uh, North Bennington's hidden mysteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no idea that this had even gone on. So then when I was reading this and, you know, researching it, it was so incredibly exciting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the fact that they got clubs and stole train cars. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> well, some of the authorities refer to it as the Second Battle of Bennington. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, gee, we should have a reenactment once in a while. This is a very dramatic situation. <laughs> huh. All right. So what happened next? Well, perhaps the core, pro the core of the problem between Thomas Vale's Troy and Bennington and Trenner Park's Bennington and Rutland Railroads was that both men were possessive of the B&R. Neither owned it, of course, but the T&B had possessed it in the past ten years under a lease. Park might think he was the owner because he had voting control of its stocks and bonds and expected to take full control when the lease ended in 1867. Instead, the T&B took questionable steps to continue the release, so Park sued in Vermont courts and tried to attach four T&B locomotives in Vermont, starting the Railroad War. The T&B forcibly took the locomotives away from the Bennington Sheriff and back to Troy, in effect sidestepping the lawsuit. Then they stayed out of Bennington County and let the lawsuit wither on the vine. Park might have gone into the federal courts, but did not. After that, Park was in control of the BNR, but its only access to the west and south was blocked by the T&B, which pulled its trains uh, back from the state line station and absolutely refused to transfer any passengers of freight to or from the BNR. If one could get from Bennington to the T&B at Hoosick Junction by stagecoach or take freight there by wagon, one could travel south and east to Troy on the T&B or north through New York to Rutland on the Rensselaer and Saratoga, with which the T&B had a contract. The T&B didn't get Parks Railroad because it could use the Saratoga line. Park badly needed the T&B to lift its embargo, but they were fighting mad about the lawsuit and the attempt to attach their locomotives. 
The Troy people wished Park the worst and enjoyed his discomfiture. Bennington Commerce was suffering. Mass meetings were held in Bennington where speakers denounced the Troy management for making Bennington suffer in a fight against an individual. Citizens such as J. Halsey Cushman and H. G. Root supported Park, but a letter from Park to Root says Park felt many people were becoming his enemies. Park's Bennington attorney, Edward Phelps, knew Thomas Vale and his manager, Mr. Robinson, and tried to arrange a meeting, but reported that conciliation was hopeless. Phelps then advised Park's Park that his best way out was to inquire a little railroad existing from Chatham, New York, to Lebanon Springs and build it into Bennington. Much could be said for and against that plan. The fact is that Park decided to do it, which may tell us something about him. This writer has the benefit of being able to look backwards, and so it is easy to suggest that if Park could have seen the future, he might have decided to find some better solution. The little railroad from Chatham had, be had begun early in the 1850s, and soon failed for lack of funds after about 10 miles of construction. It was 40 more miles to Bennington. Park made a quick decision and bought up the stock, gathered three large teams of workers, and began construction, which continued about a year and a half. Meanwhile, he raised as much money as he could. A financier from New York City came into it. Money was raised from Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt of the New York Central Railroad. Vermont towns such as Bennington issued their own municipal bonds in exchange for bonds of his Lebanon Springs Railway. In those same years, he sold his Panama Railway to the French government and involved himself in California financial adventures, such as the Emma and Mariposa mines, for which he drew much suspicion of financial wrongdoing, but it was never proved against him. The corkscrew line got its name because of 260 tight turns through hilly terrain which could not be taken from with much speed. The line came up from Lebanon Springs through Petersburg until west of Bennington Center, then turned east across Gypsy Lane, did a half circle clockwise around the point where the monument now stands, crossed Main Street of the Old Catholic Church, now the Bennington Museum, then made a half circle counterclockwise, which didn't quite reach Elm Street. Then, heading north, it crossed Main Street at the Depot Pond and went straight into the B&R Yards. From 1869, therefore, we had two railroads. The Troy Railroad Management apparently did nothing to hinder his building of the Lebanon Springs Railway. In 1875, they finally reached their Hoosick Tunnel, and having no more reason to pass by Rutland to get to Boston, their use of the Saratoga Line ended, and the embargo at Hoosick Junction ended too. But Thomas Vale had, perceived, had perhaps achieved his revenge on Park for the lawsuit and attachments by pushing him into building the Lebanon Valley to Bennington, for which there was no good reason this writer can see other than to rescue Park's fortune and perhaps his pride. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's pretty impressive that he could get, get three crews to do that line of 40 miles in just a year and a half. Was it able to build, able to build railroads that fast? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And there were companies, too, that uh, tra would travel around from uh, place to place to actually build a railroad. Actually, it's what happens now. Much of the rebuilding, uh, major rebuilding, occur because they bring in an outside contractor to help with various aspects of construction that may be overseen by the railroad. Mm -hmm. And a current example today, for example, is they're re relaying a line that was built from uh, the Amtrak station Rensselaer up, up, they call it up the hill to up along Patroon Creek, mm -hmm. up to where they have two tracks to Schenectady mm -hmm. and uh, building to a very high standard. But this said, uh, Railroads were where the money was. You could make and you mm -hmm. could control. And this was the beginning of the period where everybody wanted to control mm -hmm. uh, a territory. And um, Trenner Park got in early and uh, had high hopes for the railroad. Hmm. I vaguely recall that back in the 1940s or 1950s that Bennington uh, finally paid off the bonds that had been issued to pay for this railroad. Is that right? Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> hmm. So was there, what would be the problem of going to New Nevin uh, getting right of ways? Was there a rail bed there already that he followed or did he have to buy up right of ways across <clears throat> all kind of private land? Well, they had to buy up. Uh, in many cases, the land was donated. People were very eager to get the railroad. Oh. And today, when so many of these lines have been abandoned, it's always a question, who owns the right-of-way <laughs> after the railroad is uh, torn up? Yeah. For years and years, for example, the uh, 
line in Bennington has survived pretty much intact because the Boston and Maine, I understand, owned the parcels that the railroad was on. They bought them up so there'd never be another uh, comp uh, competitor. Although, even though uh, we talked about how difficult the line was with all its curves and crossings of the highways and things, uh, it uh, still represented a, a, a way to block anybody else coming up with a, with a competitor. And uh, you have to remember, this was the era of cutthroat, mm -hmm. make my money fast, and mm -hmm. uh, not always fairly. As, as for the bonds, I've heard that the bonds were, there was an issue with the bonds, and maybe in the further thing you could read to us about what the issue was with the bonds. Yeah, this has a lot about the bonds. Okay, good. <laughs> The truth about Trenor Park is hard to find, and it probably will never be satisfactorily known. He did not leave a large paper trail, considering his prominence. What exists at the Park McCullough House will not tell whether he was an honest man who attracted enemies and accusations or something else. Such charges were often made against him, but never proved, so far as we know. In thinking about Trenor Park's reputation, we need to keep in mind that in those early railroad days when every town wanted a railroad to help it develop, any businessman active in the effort to build one could do no wrong in the community. But later on, when such railroads had been built and got into financial trouble because the need had been overestimated, some people who had put money in it and couldn't get it back suspected they had been defrauded by the men who led the effort. Trenor Park may have done no misdeeds in railroad finance, but simply got into a bad financial venture and struggled wildly to get out of it. Six years after the corkscrew rail line opened, in 1875, the same year that the TNB finished the Hoosick Tunnel and ended the embargo at Hoosick Junction, the selectmen of Bennington were involved in a lawsuit arising out of bonds, which the town had issued to help park finance the Lebanon Springs extension to Bennington. In the six years, the selectmen had changed their minds about park. Now they accused him of fraud, financial manipulation, theft, and other crimes and misdeeds, and seemed determined to make him the defendant in a suit instead of themselves. To this reader, the charges leveled at Trenor Park sounded as if they were designed to defend the selectmen against voters' blame over money, over money lost. We don't know how the lawsuit turned out, but perhaps we will know more about it later. For the moment, it may be enough to tell what the selectmen alleged, not for its truth, but to see the difficulties Park's building of the corkscrew line brought him. To start, they blamed him for the railroad war, saying his lawsuit and attachments were based on fictitious claims against the TNB. They claimed that the public meetings at which Park tried to convince the voters to approve a bond issue, he declared he didn't need the money, but only wanted the bonds to show local support, and stated that the town would never lose a dollar on the bonds, as he would personally guarantee that to everyone. That was fraudulent, they said, because a man upstate was now suing the town on a bond, and Park wouldn't pay. In fact, they said, Park had arranged for this man to sue the town in order to force the town to start paying. Therefore, the bonds were issued on fraudulent promises, so the court should, de should declare the bond issues invalid. Beyond that, the selectmen believed that the public vote of approval had been procured through voting irregularities arranged by Park, and so no approval of the bond issue had ever been given. Park, they said, had borrowed money from Commodore Vanderbilt, who had at one time been interested in adding the Lebanon, li Lebanon, <laughs> Lebanon line and B&R to his holdings, but Vanderbilt was defrauded and now had an attachment on Park's real property in Bennington to the amount of half a million dollars. The attachment, at least, is true and can be seen at the town clerk's office. Park also mortgaged the two lines to New York City banks, they said, for half a million dollars each. Later, these banks foreclosed, and the two lines were sold at auction. Park bid 50000 for the rail for the BNR, while his New York City associate bid the same for the Lebanon Road. These bids were accepted, but the checks had not cleared. From all these allegations, and many more not mentioned here, the selectmen seemed to believe that Park and his associates were in no financial problems at all, and had never been, but were acting so in order to pile up fortunes for themselves, the same sort of underhanded manipulations of which Park had been suspected in the Mariposa and Emma Mine difficulties, so they said, but which we know were never proved. The selectmen offered no proof, or any idea of how such things were done, or where the proof might be found. As said before, this writer does not know the result of this lawsuit. Seven years later, in 1882, Park was in California, where he had a new wife and a house in San Rafael. Although the Transcontinental Railroad was in operation, he was on a ship in the Pacific approaching Panama when he suddenly died. The causes have never been made clear, although a recent book on the Panama Canal says he died of an overdose of barbiturates. A few years later, a vanity book about famous Vermonters of the era, 
probably prepared by someone close to him, stated that his Vermont railroad activities were a great problem for him and very costly. A look at his estate papers here may not be very informative because there was no will, there is no mention of the big house or assets in New York and California, no mention of the new wife, yet he seems to have died with no railroad stock, few railroad bonds, and the amount of money going it to his two daughters and one son was small considering the wealth he supposedly had earlier. After his death, the B&R and the corkscrew line continued to function. About 1900, both lines passed from whoever owned them to the Rutland Railroad. They gradually lost riders and freight businesses, like most railroads in the days of automobiles, trucks, airplanes, and interstate highways, until in the early 1950s, the corkscrew line ran for the last time. The B&R carried on until the, until the early 1960s, when the legislature, trying to keep the B&R going, bought up the right-of-way. The B&R soon quit, too. The state went into the railroad business as the Vermont Railway, but it's small business. A recent Banner article tells that we will have rail service again from Albany through Hoosick and North Bennington to Rutland and Burlington on new tracks to be built over several years at a cost of $70 million. This writer isn't expressing any opinion, but only noting the irony of going back to the future. <laughs> <laughs> and bringing that up to today, the uh, Amtrak and the state of Vermont are restoring rail service mm. to Bennington and Manchester by having a motor coach run from um, Rensselaer Station to um, Bennington and Manchester. And the process is going on as we talk in Montpelier. And in a few weeks, they should identify a, a, an operator. And although the bus will not run on flanged wheels, <laughs> it will be a rail connection to the rest of the rail system which I think is vitally important to this area because it yeah. will bring back, uh, put us on sort of the uh, branch of the main line, get us into a comfortable way to New York City and make it more desirable to come as, for Vermont's hospitality and also for Vermont's uh, development. Mm -hmm. We're going to spend about $54 million to repair the uh, uh, building, the complex um, down at the Putman Hotel and uh, one of the things that this rail will do will be made it easy for people to walk a few blocks to interestingly enough the railroad station <laughs> take a bus to New York City to take complete their rail journey <clears throat> hmm. well so full cycle yeah <laughs> <laughs> looks like a bright future <laughs> uh, well it's a it's a troubled past. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a troubled past. I might mention uh, about the bonds issued at that time. There was a lot of really unusual uh, goings on. A Pownal native, Jim Fisk, who was oh, the Jim partner Fisk. of a notorious financier, Jay Gould. Mm -hmm. And when Cornelius Vanderbilt attempted to secure control of the Erie Railroad, uh, Fisk and Gould issued some highly fraudulent stock. And as Fisk said, as long as the printing press doesn't break down, we'll give the old hog his belly full. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> wow. Great times to live if you were a rich person. It's interesting how time cycle, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have a, another portion of the program, uh, which is an earlier conversation and hope Nathan, when do you hope to show this? Well, I, I thought maybe we'd talk about this picture. Okay. A little bit. Let me get behind the camera and see if I can focus a little closer on that. <clears throat> and then, then we can go into the interview. Okay. The Exchange Club of Chatham, New York ran a, a number of excursion trains after World War II, and the final one was on September 30th, 1951, which I had the privilege of riding from Chatham to Rut Rutland and return. And this uh, was would be the final run of a passenger train over the uh, corkscrew. All right. Okay, so now I guess what we'll do 
is uh, go right into the interview that we took on Tuesday, and that will probably end our program, and uh, we'll resume our next program in June with the remainder of that interview and our questions and comments about it. So if Ryan wants to put that on, we'll watch the interview. Hi, uh, George Larigo from North Bennington, Vermont. And uh, we are at the Brookside, the Brookdale, Fillmore Some Pond site on their nature trail. And, you're saying. Okay. and <laughs> as you look around Bennington, you see all sorts of things about Bennington that you never wonder how they got there. The and what we're looking at here, we're going to follow along for a little bit, is the uh, original right of way of the Corkscrew Railroad, which is going to be the topic of our presentation today and uh, so come join us as we walk down the original right of way of the corkscrew railway stop Pretty much a straight shot over Durham Road. Right? Oh, yeah. How far are you going to go? Oh, I thought we'll go down to the big tree here. Huh? Down to this big tree? Okay. <clears throat> So you got lots of red winged blackbirds down here. <laughs> yeah, it's a great spot. Great nature spot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm George Largo, I live up in North Bennington. Uh, people know me as a, um, a rail nut, a person that's fascinated by railroad history. And today we are out at the Brookside, I've got to get this right, Brookdale, Patrick. Brookdale Fillmore Pond. Brookdale Fillmore Pond, uh, and they've been very helpful to us with the program today and getting this set up. With uh, Patrick Purcell, did I get that right? Right. Who is a lifetime railroader, the real thing. <laughs> and uh, the topic of today's uh, program is the corkscrew. Um, and Patrick, how did that name come about, corkscrew? Because of the many curves and uh, the, and the circuitous routing between Bennington and Chatham, New York. Uh, the railroad actually crossed uh, Vermont Route 9 uh, between Bennington and just beyond the state line five times in eight miles. Uh, the first crossing was down at Main Street in Bennington, 
near the uh, station, across in front of the museum. Then out near Ferial Farms, point called Anthony. Then there's a was a crossing at the state line, and the final crossing was uh, where the uh, route New York, New York Nine uh, intersects with the uh, new Two Seventy Nine. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then it went down and connected with what railroad? It crossed the what was the Boston and Maine for many years. It's now uh, the uh, Norfolk. Well, it's owned partially by the Norfolk Southern, but it's the uh, called Pan Am Railway now. Crossed at Petersburg Junction and then went on south to Chatham, New York. Mm -hmm. Well, it's ironic that that railroad is uh, going to be uh, getting a, a $250,000, I'm sorry, $2.5 $2 .5 million investment as the traffic picks up. And I understand from people on the on the Vermont Railway that the re one of the reasons for that is that uh, the business is coming back, most of the freight business is coming back. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine that this must have been an area where there was tremendous, uh, Bennington must have been a big railroad town, was it? Oh yes, yes. It was served in the old days by the Bennington and Rutland Railroad and then you had the Lebanon Springs Railroad coming in from the south. And then you had another wonderfully named uh, company named the Bennington and Glastonbury Railroad Mining and Manufacturing Company, mm -hmm. which dated from about 1875 to the mid-1880s. Now to go back to the, um, your comment about the spending the money, that's down at Hoosick Junction. Now that was the, the original line, the Bennington and Rutland Railroad, ran from Bennington through North Bennington over to the state line at uh, a White, White, uh, yeah, right. White Creek, White Creek, New York. And the railroad was, they connected there with the Troy and Boston Railroad. And the Troy and Boston leased that railroad to Bennington Rutland. This was about the railroad, uh, B&R was completed in 1852. And a branch was built to Bennington in 1854. Now, the, uh, Troy and Boston leased the B&R for a number of years until about 1867. And there was a major dispute. The lease ran out and the uh, B&R claimed that the property had not been properly maintained and they instituted a lawsuit. They sent the sheriff up to North Bennington and seized a number of uh, cars and engines belonging to the Troy and Boston. Well, the TMB was not about to let that go by, so they sent up a, a crew of uh, roughnecks from Troy. I understand they cleared out the bars on the yes, first street in Troy, something filled like, them up. <laughs> something like that. Well, they arrived with great clubs and other weapons and drove the sheriff of Bennington and his deputies off the property. Well, the, the uh, uh, answer to that was that the TMB closed off completely any uh, interchange of passengers or freight uh, with, with the Bennington and Rutland. So the BNR was in desperate need for a southern connection and there was a little railroad coming up from Chatham as far as Lebanon Springs. So they went uh, at Trenner Park from North Bennington and other notables went down to New York City to try to raise money and went to see Cornelius Vanderbilt. Well, the Commodore was not very promising at all. Uh, he told them that there'd be grass growing on their railroad in a hundred years. And another version says he told them in three generations, which is basically the same time. So he's pretty accurate. The railroad was completed in 1869 and was torn up in 1953. Wow. So it's, uh, it's uh, Commodore Vanderbilt maybe had an insight that no one else had back then, but I understand he was quite a character. Oh yes, yes indeed. And and he, did he eventually become one of the financiers of this line? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, later on, a son-in-law to one of the Vanderbilts, a Dr. Stuart Webb, uh, came to Vermont, he built the uh, farm up in Shelburne, the great Shelburne Museum today, and uh, was involved in the railroads of that area he bought, he controlled the Rutland Railroad, and around 1900 to 1901, uh, he built an extension from the Rutland from the Rutland Railroad at Burlington, north through the islands of Lake Champlain, up to Auburn. 
he purchased the Ogdensburg and Lake Champlain Railroad, 120 miles across northern New York, and uh, also by 1901 had purchased the Bennington and Rutland and the Lebanon Springs Railroad uh, arch course crew line, which was all merged into one system. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the expression, the pea vine? Have you ever heard that expression? Yes, that was another uh, uh, nickname for our railroad here because of the numerous curves. And, and it kind of had to snake out of Bennington. Bennington was, we don't think of it today because we've got powerful cars and things, but Bennington was kind of in a pocket, wasn't it? Right. And uh, it was a river, the valley, at least the <clears throat> what we know of today as the center of Bennington, is sort of sits on a river valley, and then you had to leave, and you had to get up the hill. Yeah, it climbed 175 quickly. feet from Bennington up to this okay. area here. Uh, at our driveway at uh, Brookdale here, that's the original right-of-way, and that's where the railroad evened out, uh, reached the summit. There was a siding called Anthony, which is just west of here, uh, which went up towards the Jewett Road. Uh, in near Fairdale Farms, and uh, there was a station building there until about 1935, so it was a regular stop. And then it turned downhill, of course, uh, dropped about 300 feet down into the Hoosick Valley, Petersburg. That's, that's right, even today when you follow the railroad, and, and, <clears throat> and would you say it was a well-built railroad? Was it like one built to mainline standards, or was it one that was built sort of quickly? <laughs> Most of the railroads at that time were built fairly quickly. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that was one problem because people expected low fares and low freight charges, and they had were unaware of uh, the fact that the railroads were so cheaply built that maintenance costs were much higher than anticipated, and operating costs were much higher. But on the other hand, the railroads who built built the towns and cities with them, and, and Bennington was able to develop, with its water power, was able to develop a number of mills because, and we had a way to get to the markets. Right. And uh, so, and just about every industry who was anybody had their own siding, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the things that surprises me as I look at railroads today is, how do you, you know, how do you get over to it? And uh, it, then you realize that every piece of railroad, and some of them in pretty impossible situations, uh, had their own rail siding to ship their product out to uh, the rest of the world, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's uh, one of the things that always has impressed me, how railroads after the 1850s anyway, after the 1850s of railroads and country prosperity kind of went together and the other thing I think didn't Bennington have one of the first rail barons in Trenner Park? Well a local baron I guess uh, he did control the Bennington Rutland and was the principal in building the uh, railroad from yeah. Chatham into uh, Bennington. And he was born in Woodford and uh, grew up I guess among the I don't know where in Woodford exactly he lived, but he uh, got the gold dust, didn't he? He went out to yeah, the California. California after having uh, apprenticed as a lawyer. And when he got out there, uh, all the miners were out digging in the cold and sweat and dirt. And he was back processing their claims and making money off of each claim. Until, as I understand it, uh, one of the most interesting claims was the home state mine that he actually took an interest in. He could see what were the good products and what weren't. And the home state mines, and that's where I think he made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, after doing that, I guess that all happened pretty quick in his life. And, uh, after doing that, he had to come back, and when he came back east, he came back through the Isthmus of Panama mm -hmm. and realized that what they really needed was a railroad across the Isthmus of Panama that he got involved in, 
And you say, well, what in the world would you want to do that for? Well, it's all these guys that are going to make their fortune in the West mm -hmm. and changing from one ocean to the other. And he uh, was able to uh, get that built and take over what would have been a really dangerous passage through jungles and swamps and you can imagine everything crawling and doing that. And uh, then he came back uh, and he had a railroad, and not just a railroad, but the first transcontinental railroad mm -hmm. was a Woodford Man. Can you imagine <laughs> that? And uh, we didn't get our big railroad until 1869 when they completed the Union Pacific, Central Pacific. Right. But uh, Trainer Park had done it earlier. And then good luck met him when he came back. Uh, he had money to spare. And uh, he uh, built himself a little country place, <laughs> which we call the Park McCullough House today, or Park McCullough Foundation. And that was kind of the country residence of his, anyway. Mm -hmm. And he married well. He married the McCulloughs, I think, didn't he? Yes. And so they kind of uh, entered the era of great uh, wealth coming in to this area along with the other people who had invested in these railroads and were now accumulating money and I might add not paying income tax <laughs> so didn't have income tax until much later but uh, we had some palatial estates uh, all through the country uh, and people came home to, to spend and place it and then something else even more extraordinary with Trenner Park is that Along would come a Frenchman who wanted to build a canal across the Isthmus of Panama and he paid even more money for that railroad than it cost Trenner Park to build it and he got a, a fortune by any estimation, came back and been, went into the railroad business here where we picked him up with the corkscrew. Um, line. Uh, well, you grew up in Bennington. Do you have any childhood memories of the trains? or? Yes. Uh, we moved to Bennington from Stanford in 1945, and I'd always been a lover of trains. I had a line all set, so for the first time I could see trains in operation every day. And I'd go down to the station, which is now the Bennington Station Restaurant, and there was a very delightful old gentleman there, Mr. Bootman, who was the agent operator. Uh, and he was very friendly, and uh, when the change of time would come, he'd give me all the old timetables. So I got to uh, learn all about American railroads through this collection of timetables, I think. So it had quite an effect on my life uh, when I graduated from Ben High in 1951. When in the Army, when I went back, I was in the Transportation Corps and went to uh, Boston, uh, got my degree in uh, Northeastern and trans majoring in Transportation. Went to work for the Boston and Maine and later the Pennsylvania Railroad and its successor companies, uh, Penn Central and uh, Consolidated Rail Corporation. So I think that the Rutland uh, Railroad here had a little effect on my future life. Do you, do you have any memories of, of the trip? Because I used to do that too. I, I suppose anybody who loves trains would spend some time in a railroad depot. And uh, today I pay a lot of money to ride on certain trains. But uh, in those days, I would go down to the depot and sit on the platform of the baggage cart. Do you have memories like that? Uh, not really. Uh, it was more of a case of the milk train coming through about 7.30 every night. And if I could hear them blowing, we lived on Washington Avenue, so I could get down to the uh, crossing on Dewey Street, just below Elm there, and watch uh -huh. the milk train go through. And sometimes it was steam in those days, and sometimes we double-headed steam. So that, that must have been quite, quite a show. Oh yes, you could hear it all over town when he was working his way up the hill. And I personally never saw it, but I understand from time to time they would uh, stall on the hill and have to back all the way down to Bennington again and make another start, run for the, uh, for the hill. So, uh, 
sometimes they would they even have to have an extra engine at? sometimes they'd have double headed on the you know, and so then they would uh, would run up the grade and then of course once you're at the top uh, going down you don't need the engine so they would cut that off right yeah sometimes the switcher engine in Bennington would also mm -hmm. work as a helper up there yeah. and I understand the Rutland Railroad with if anything was uh, I, I wasn't around here but I understand if anything it was a uh, a railroad of relics. Once they got oh, something, yeah. they kept it going. Yes, yes. Uh, somebody suggested in a magazine way back around the 1950s that the whole operation should be nationalized just to make it a working museum because it was operated just the same way as a company, say, in 1890 or so. Maybe that's why the Rutland Railroad is so beloved by Probably, all the people yeah, today. Yeah. I know modelers, uh, the the uh, when the Rutland Railroad, there's a small engine in front of us today of their their uh, diesel, one of their diesel engines, and uh, that green and yellow are the two colors of the Green Mountain State. Right. And uh, but those engines were are much beloved by um, modelers and people who, I guess, had, had lived through the experience of them. Yeah. Um, but uh, we've seen many, many changes in the uh, railroad uh, industry. And when they got to Anthony's up here, then they would cut the engines off sometimes and then run them back to Bennington. Or right, right. Of course, coming the other way, and I'm not sure if they did it going towards Peterborough Junction, but the rule book required them coming uh, northbound to stop in Anthony and set up retainers on the brakes coming to come down the hill so the Bennington. train train wouldn't get out of uh, uh, do you yeah. know what the gauge was four feet eight and a half inches. no I mean uh, I'm sorry the the uh, the grade I got misspoke uh, I'm not certain I, I've never seen any reference to it it was somewhat somewhat less than one percent 